Hello, in this video we're going to talk about drag and then more specifically we're going to focus on lift induced drag. But first, any body traveling through air, traveling through a liquid, has can produce drags in a multitude of fashions. I would say the two most common that most widely known would be a form drag and like skin friction drag. So for a, a vertical flat plate, air is flowing this way, hitting the plate. This will produce basically 100% form drag. And that can, that makes sense. As this is flying, I guess put this vertical plate is being pushed to the air. It's not producing any lift. It's just hitting that air straight on. And that's going to be 100% form drag. Very high pressure in the front here, very low pressure in the back. Basically going to be all form drag with basically no skin friction. There's very little travel along the surface of the plate for the air. So basically there's not going to be any skin friction. But then if we look at, let's say, a very thin flat plate going through the air here, where the air just goes on top and the bottom, again there's no drag. The air speed is equal on both sides. The air is not changing any directions. This is basically going to be 100% skin friction drag and zero form drag. Again, this is a very thin plate. Then we can consider, let's say, a, a, so a ball or a sphere or something like that. So now the air is traveling around it more, but there's still some, but the air is still going to break off into vortices here. There's going to be a low pressure system back here. Now, because the air is traveling, or the liquid or the fluid is traveling more along the ball, this is going to be still mostly form drag. But now there's more skin friction in this scenario versus like this scenario. But some. And maybe I'll do a video on like dimples on a golf ball, but that's to reduce the skin friction drag and the form drag. It does both of those things. Now, we're talking about aerodynamics, we're talking about planes. We want to talk about airfoils. So this would be the cross section of an airfoil right here. So as air travels around this, this wing has almost no form drag, very aerodynamic. Their airfoils are designed basically to have no, little to no form drag. If your airfoil has a lot of form drag, then that's a very poorly designed airfoil. There's going to be some skin friction drag due to the air traveling across the surface of the wing. But there's also, this has now lift induced drag. So now we're going to talk about lift induced drag. What is it? So any body, any shape, any object moving through the air that's creating lift also is going to produce a form of drag due to that drift, due to that lift. And the reason why is that you effectively you are redirecting air in a way that involves energy loss, involves vortices being created here it creates a backwash of air that's moving not in the not in the traditional way that the air was coming at the wing so it creates a certain drag that's kind of behind the wing it creates different pressure systems and which produces more drag so Classically, air airplane wings have a lot of this induced drag, lift induced drag. So lift induced drag sometimes comes from the high to low pressure differences on a wing. So this is our, kind of like we're looking at the back of a, of a plane. And as we know, we have high pressure below and then low pressure on top and this is what generates our 
lift of the wing. But around the tip of the wing, there's this area where it goes from high pressure to low pressure. So what the air on the bottom wants to do, it doesn't want to stay at that high pressure. It's looking for the path of least resistance to the low pressure air. And that, is, and so it, it comes in the form of these perpendicular vortices that come off the wingtips, just like this. Okay, so you have the air going from high pressure to low pressure. But unfortunately, this creates a lot of drag on the wing because these are now perpendicular to the flow of the aircraft and creates drag and can also create a lot of other problems for like handling and things like that. So there's a couple ways to limit this. The first, well first let's look at our equation for this induced drag. All right, so here's our lift. So this is our drag induced. It's our lift squared divided by the dynamic pressure, which is this, one half rho v squared. So density times velocity times pi. And then our b, or b here, that is our wing length or wing span. Okay, so as we can see here, the longer your wing span is going to be for the same amount of lift, the drag induced is going to be less. This can also be seen, you could also write this as in the form of a high aspect wing. So a wing with a high aspect ratio this drag induced is going to be less too because the aspect ratio is going to be in the bottom of this equation. So that's going to be a less. But obviously there's limits on the amount of about the length of, of the wing. You can only get so long, you know, there's other considerations to other things to consider like the weight, structural rigidity of the wing and things like that. So a way you can kind of get around this while having still a relatively short wing for other purposes like getting through airport gates and stuff like that is to introduce this concept called wingtips or winglets. And those are the things you see on the side of a plane, on the side of the wings of the plane. They kind of look like this. Okay, so we've all seen this on a plane. So now we have high pressure, low pressure, and the air still wants to go from high pressure to low pressure, but it has a more difficult time doing so. There's less of a gradient here. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it knocks down these vortices. So now these vortices coming off this wing are a lot smaller than they were. And it produces left less induced drag. So that's pretty cool. I'm not going to get into all the equations involved in it, but you can imagine, imagine that. So going from, you know, this big gradient to here, where there's less of a gradient, less of the size of these, it produces less induced drag. These have a couple other effects. They can produce a little bit more lift because obviously they're not straight up and perpendicular. And these can be shaped, they shaped like an airfoil. So, so those are winglets. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, why doesn't every single plane have winglets? And you can look at a plane called like a, a, the Boeing 777. That's a very common plane. And you can see it has no winglets. You might be like, well, what are they doing? But ultimately that plane has a long enough wingspan. So a high enough aspect ratio where it's not as important to have the winglets. And winglets can also introduce other technical issues when designing a plane. So sometimes it's easier just to have a 
a normal a normal wing if the aspect ratio, the wingspan, is long enough to justify not having the winglets. And there's a couple other ways we can reduce this lift-induced drag effect of the air going from the top of the wing or the bottom of the wing to the top. So you can make an elliptical wing shape. So this is looking the top down on a plane. And so sometimes you'll see, and this is like old school, like World War II fighters, you'll see this. Which I have a plane right here. As you can see, the wing has kind of shaped like this. It's an elliptical shape. And now this induces the effects of these wingtip vortices compared to a wing that's like perfectly squared off like this. High effects for wingtip vortices, lower effects for wingtip vortices.